Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Grieve Like a Man podcast. Today, I sit down with my new friend, Davey Blackburn. He is the founder and director of Nothing is Wasted Ministries. His grief journey began all the way back in 2015 when his wife, Amanda, was murdered during a home invasion. In the conversation, we get into the aftermath. After that all began, we talk about many of the unique places that God has showed up all along this journey. And lastly, we get into some of the different steps he's taken to really rebuild and reconstruct his life over the past nine years. Now, this is part one of a two-part episode. Obviously, part one is airing here on the Grieve Like a Man podcast feed, and we'll be airing part two over on the Sean Tabbitt Show podcast feed. I got so much out of this interview. I was challenged. I was encouraged. As a man who's walking my own grief journey right now, I really feel like Davey understood what I've been through, all, all of it. And so we really connected, and I hope you find encouragement and hope and challenge even in the same ways that I did throughout this conversation. So without further ado, here's my chat with Davey Blackburn. Well, my name is Davey Blackburn, and I live in Indianapolis with my wife, Christy, and our three kids, Natalia, Weston, and Cohen. Uh, we live on, we're kind of quasi homesteaders, I guess you can call us now. We just moved on, moved on to 13 acres. And so we've got all the animals, uh, whether, whether we want them or not, chickens, and it's like a goat now and, you know, kittens, barn cats, that sort of thing. So we're enjoying life and in, in kind of that peaceful serenity because really the day job is, is helping people in pain. And so it's nice to have that respite. Uh, I'm coming back. I spend a lot of my time traveling and speaking at different churches and helping those churches to launch a course that our ministry does. Our ministry is called Nothing is Wasted Ministries, but we have a course called Pain to Purpose, and it's built like a discipleship course that really helps churches and college campuses, other organizations to create healing spaces, you know, places where people can come and have those conversations and really heal from whatever pain, trauma, loss that they've suffered and help them to rebuild their life and then move forward on purpose. And so that's what our ministry does. We create a whole lot of content. We connect people in community and we have about three dozen coaches that help people as well. So that's what life looks like currently right now. And in terms of, I, I guess um, I want to get into where your grief journey starts, so to speak, mm -hmm. but uh, just like what was, what was normal life? You were a church planner, you know, you had one child, one on the way you were, you were living the, the pastor's dream. Like it felt like everything yeah. was just lining up. Yeah. Yeah. We had planted a church. I was on staff with my wife, uh, Amanda, at a church in South Carolina, really large, fast growing church. And so that's where we cut our teeth in ministry. And it's where we really got a big vision for what God could do through the local church. And then after about four years on staff there, he really tugged on our hearts to, um, step out into this really big daunting endeavor. And that was to plant a church. So we moved to Indianapolis to plant. My wife was from Elkhart, Indiana, and I was born in, in Indianapolis. So it kind of made sense. That was a, a place that seemed like a, somewhere we wanted to establish roots. And, and so we got on the ground, started doing the work of church planting, which is very difficult work. But after about four years, we began to see some momentum. And we, we were just like you said, Sean, we were we were really coming into this place where we thought, man, this is going to take, and we were seeing our dreams come to life in front of us, and the church was really starting to to thrive and be a vibrant, living thing. And then on November 10th, 2015, I left early in the morning to go to the gym, which is what I would normally do on Tuesday mornings. And while I was away at the gym, there were three men who were on a random crime spree in our city, and they actually broke into the home three doors down from me. They saw me leave for the gym that morning. And decided to break into my home. And Amanda um, was caught up in that. And we had a 15 month old at the time who was in his crib. He was untouched, unharmed. His name is Weston. And uh, we were pregnant with our second. But Amanda was shot three times. And I came home from the gym and found her lying on our living room floor. And she was breathing still when I found her, but she was breathing very laboriously. She was unconscious. And so I just thought if we got her to the hospital, everything was going to be fine, you know? Um, I just didn't have any context for what had happened. And it was such a traumatic moment that everything was just kind of flying by me in, in some respects. And, uh, when I got to the hospital, they told me what had happened, that she had three bullet wounds and, um, that the prognosis was very grim. And even though I believed in faith that God was going to heal her, um, 24 hours later, she was pronounced officially deceased. And on November 11th, 2015, I lost my best friend, my soulmate, my partner in ministry, it was actually, Sean, four years to the day 
that we had that we packed a moving van up to move from South Carolina to Indianapolis to plant this church. So never would have thought that this was the story that I was living, but now overnight I was a single dad to Weston and trying to figure out how to grieve through this. Um, when most days it felt like it was, it was going to overtake me, the grief was, and then trying to figure out how to help our congregation heal and grieve through this too. Well, and I wonder too, like I really resonated with how the book started because like you just talked about it was a normal Tuesday. Y'all had your routines. You were just doing normal life. Like uh, we just did the two year anniversary of when my wife had a seizure at home. We found out she had cancer. It was just this past Saturday, and I had written about it on Saturdays. I'm just processing because we have lots of friends and family and people we're in ministry with who followed our whole journey. And so as yeah. I've been processing after the fact, I you know I basically wrote it was a normal work day, and I was doing this, this, and this, and then everything changed. So like you totally. Yeah at least drew me in with how you started the book. We're like, you, you have no clue that your life is about Don't. to just flip upside down. It's one of the uh, sobering realities of life. I think is that you just really have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, I think we have our, you know, the man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps is what scripture says. And so we think we have this idea or this construct or this strategy or this plan and this routine of how life is going to play out. But at the end of the day, I mean, control is the biggest illusion of all time. And so that can frighten us. I mean, that can cause a lot of anxiety for sure, unless we understand, you know, and I don't want to be cliche at all, but unless we understand the, the fact that like what's over our head is still under his feet, you know, sorry, I was just very cliche right there, but <laughs> you know, that he really does hold our world in his hands and we can trust him. And so, um, but it is one of the sobering realities of life. Yeah. Well, and, and I find too, the. In terms of prayer, like, uh, again, I've, I, I work and do my faith expression in the charismatic space, and I have for a long time. So I've seen people healed, you know, praying for healing is so normal. And right. yet, you know, we can go through a season where we're praying for healing and we don't get answers that we want to that prayer. Yeah. You know, and I know for some people, they get to a place where they're angry with God and they just run in a, a different direction. Um, you know, one of the things I've talked to people a lot about is, you know, and, and I don't always want to say, I think it was this person's time to go home, but sometimes it is time for somebody to go home to heaven. And yeah, it's not like heaven is some sign, some kind of a second or third prize. Um, right. We don't like that. Our person is gone. We had plans and dreams that are unfulfilled, but, um, you know, I, I do feel there could be a tendency if we don't get that answer to prayer, we kind of feel like we've somehow failed. Yeah. Yeah. And or so we I don't didn't know, have enough faith or, yeah, I don't you know, know how, like, like obviously my like my journey was over 19 months yours is like 24 right. hours of crazy like how did and you talk about praying in the hospital like how do you wrestle with that when you're like this god this is not the answer i wanted yeah you know that's a very big question to wrestle with because you're right you begin to think that maybe i didn't have enough faith or that you know it, it, you could go everywhere from like was if how is god good and loving if he's going to allow this to happen did he cause this to happen you know it, was he not powerful enough to stop this or prevent this? Like you begin to wrestle with all of those questions because everything that I had believed now seemed to get upended in this moment. And that's what tragedy or loss or grief tends to do, which I also think is a really important part of grief is that, you know, we have this construct of who we think God is and what he should do for us, especially in Western American culture. We believe that God's kind of a vending machine God where He's supposed to, you know, if we input A, then, you know, B is going to come out. And I put in six we, quarters, God, I need yeah. to get the thing that I'm supposed to get. And, and even though we may know it cognitively, right, until you actually experience pain and the disorientation, you're not confronted with that reality to have to begin to wrestle with the theodicy, which is the theology of pain and suffering. And you're in charismatic circles, and I love being a part of some charismatic circles as well. We partner with a lot of churches too, but that particular theology often lends toward not really being able to wrestle with some of the grief and pain and hardship that there is in life. It's almost like shout it out. It doesn't exist. And you know, victory is in Christ. And yes, it is. But first there was the crucifixion. There was the grave. And for us to share in his resurrection, we first must share in his suffering, as Peter said. And so I think that was the component of all of this that I just, I just thought as someone who was following Jesus, and more importantly, someone who was in the center of God's will doing his work, my family was going to be protected. There was going to be this like force field around us. Sure, we might go through hard betrayals from friends, but there's no way something bad was going to happen in my life. 
And that got completely upended. But then when I go look in scripture, you know, and, and we'll talk about it in a second. I think the most important thing is that God showed up for me, right? Personally, right? I didn't go to scripture immediately. But when I look at scripture retroactively and I see that all the people that followed after Jesus, the ones who followed the closest, their lives ended horrifically. You've got all of these disciples who believed because they saw the risen Jesus and they held to that belief because of that, they were martyred for their, for their faith. You've also got other martyrs, right? That Hebrews 11 tells us about that were sawn in two, that were tortured, that were, and it says that, says some pretty amazing things. It says that, that they counted it worthy, right? They counted what they went through worth going through for the cause or what they believed to be true, what they knew to be true on the other side. Their world was not, their hope was not anchored and tied and tethered to the trappings of this world. It was anchored in something much beyond this world. And that is a heavenly perspective. And that reorients everything, right? And then it also says the world was not worthy of them. So, you know, so you start to begin to go, oh, all right, this is disoriented my view of who God is, who myself, who I, who I view myself to be and what this world to be. But, it, but it, there is a reorientation or a reconstruction that happens through grief. If you walk with God in grief, he'll begin to put the pieces back together and show you he's actually a more loving father than what you ever thought. He's more caring, you know, he's more justice oriented than you ever thought. Like he is going to make this right, but it's really these pathways of pain that help us get to that place of understanding. And one of the things I think guys will see in hindsight is how much God showed up in the middle of everything. I think the difficulty in the moment is you're legitimately just you're one foot in step of the other, just trying to figure out how to get through the day, yeah. how to manage what's ahead of you. Um, and, and you share some of this at the book in terms of, uh, you know, the surgeon who took your wife off life support and right. was, you know, going to get her organs ready to be given to somebody else. God showed up there in a really unexpected way. You talk about the casket was, was, yeah. was very significant. So just get, again, I feel like we see those things more in hindsight after we have time to process right. and get away from the trauma some. Right. Uh, but just talk to us about some of the really unexpected ways where like, you can look back like, man, God was all over this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right. You know, you look at Psalm 23 verse four and it says, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't have to fear because he is with us. But then it also said at the very end of that, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. We you don't know something's following you until you look back. So it is usually in hindsight when you look back that you go, oh, God, his thumbprints, as I call it in the book, have been all over this story. And now I see where he has shown up. And John Flavel, who's a Puritan writer, he says, providence is like the Hebrew language. It can only be read backwards, you know, looking back. But in the midst of it, I'm so grateful in my story. And I believe this is true for many people if they're looking for it. I think sometimes we see what we're looking for. And there's so many people that are so caught off guard by the tragedy in their life. And they're so angry at God that they actually close themselves off rather than in their anger going, God, you need to show me where you are in all of this. I think God actually honors that, that kind of like, like real incessant, like the incessant widow, like this real incessant Job, like, like, where are you? What are you doing in this? I think God's like, well, I want to walk tenderly with you and show you that. And he did for me. I mean, the first occasion of that was while we were in the hospital. This is where we got the whole phrase, nothing is wasted. We're in the hospital. I'm sitting up next to her hospital bed with her sister. And I knew if Amanda could hear anything that she would want to listen to worship music, particularly from Elevation Worship. She used to listen to it while she would run and stuff. And then, she, So I put on Pandora radio station on a phone at the foot of her bed, Elevation Worship radio station. Well, Pandora is randomized. You don't get to choose what song's going to come up. The first song that came up was the song, Nothing is Wasted by Elevation Worship. And it was like in that moment, Amber and I looked at each other, there were no words necessary. It's like God was saying, hey, listen, this is not going to end the way that you want it to, but I promise you, I'm not going to waste this. And that was so significant because of what Amanda was doing as a hobby or a business endeavor. She was refinishing furniture. She'd have me pick up these like dressers or these side tables off the side of the road, like I'm coming back from work like I'm American Pickers, you know, and I'm just like, and the first time I brought one back to her, I was like, what are you going to do with this? This is garbage. Like, this is trash. And she said, Davey, trust me, give me a little time and I'll turn this into something beautiful. 
And I talk about this in the book that her first show that she did, she turned this incredible profit from all of this junk that she had picked up. She restored value back into it. What the world had said, there is no value. This is senseless. You can't use this. She saw purpose in it. She saw restorative, redemptive power in it. And that's what God brought us back to with this whole idea of nothing is wasted. Amanda saw it in this furniture. She also saw it in people because she was in ministry and she loved hurting and broken people. But, but that now we were seeing that in our situation and God was going, Hey, Romans eight twenty eight is true. I will work all things together for the good of those who love me, who are called according to my purposes. And, um, and so that, that really became an anchor for us and a, a beacon for us to, you know, you talk about in scripture where you see these like stones of remembrance that the Israelites would lay to go, that's where God showed up. That was some, one of our stones. And I highlight over and over and over and over all these ways that God, in fact, the entire book that's what it's all about. It's like God showing up. You're going to read this and go, yeah, Davey's not that great of a guy. <laughs> like, and he's not some hero that's mustered his way through the valley of the shadow of death, you know? So definitely don't put me on a Marvel magazine, right? This is a really amazing God that's showing up for me. And if he can show up for me, he can show up for you in the same way. Well, I think that is the weird aspect of it. As you get further to the other side of this and you talk to like, Men, men, is, men, men and women ask very different questions yeah, I found do. about what, what, yes, they do. what was this like? How did you, but in general, I found a lot of people were like, you know, oh, you're, you're so strong. You're so great. All these things, you know, and it's like, I always tell people like, it's all Jesus. Like I, right. the fact that I'm upright and sane, like it's all Jesus. It's not right. any, you know? And so like that, I feel like that's the secret. I wish I could tell everybody who's walking <laughs> through a season of grief and pain is like, and cling to Jesus like you've never clung to him before. That's right. that That's what's going to get you to walking up out of the other side of that valley. Because it's it's pretty dark and dire on a day-to-day basis so um, good, yeah. as as you're in the midst of that. Sean, uh, that's what I tell people too. You but, know, They say, I don't see how you could walk through this. I would never be able to. And I just stop and go, listen, do you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Because if you are a follower of Jesus, have the Holy Spirit inside of you, that's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit that Peter said has given you everything you need for life and godliness, right? And that doesn't just mean when you're on a mountaintop. That means in every situation, he's given you everything you need for life and godliness. So I far underestimated the power of the Holy Spirit until the ministry of the Holy Spirit showed up for me in this. But I think one of the one of the gifts of uh, having children, I, I have 10 kids, nine still at home. So it's, it's a bit of a crazy house with me running the show. Um, but it is a grace, even I would say in your case, I'm sure too, you can't stop. You have to keep moving forward. It's like, all right, there has to be a roof over our head. We got to eat. We got to keep doing life. Like, I wonder if I didn't have all these people I was responsible for, if my journey would have been different, like, would I have entered a season where like, I am just going to stop because this sucks and I'm in pain versus because of, you know, one feeling responsible, which is also like, you know, the all these people who are an expression of my and my wife's love, like I got to care for these people and get them to the finish line. So like, I feel like that was a real grace for me to keep moving forward. Um, Like I'm curious, like how did that dynamic, like, all right, well, there's the two of us now we're going to keep moving ahead. How how did that work for you? Well, I certainly don't have 10 and nine at home. (laughs) It's not a a competition. One is I know you're right, but I am very (laughs) impressed. (laughs) So I'm definitely not in the Olympics. I would say you're an Olympic gold medalist if you're walking that road but man that that is and it's incredible and i felt a semblance of that where it was like this isn't just my journey this is weston's journey too and i now feel a sense of responsibility not that i didn't feel a sense of responsibility before but i felt a sense that i'm gonna have to walk i've got to get up out of bed because i don't have a choice weston needs me so if there's no other motivation that i have it's for him right And I want him to have the most normal childhood that he can possibly have, even though his whole world has gotten completely disrupted. And I know that his childhood hasn't been, and I knew forecasting it, it wasn't going to be normal, but there was a a motivation there. And then what was, what was really cool to see is how God began to stretch me and grow me in the, the areas of deficiency that I felt, you know, the areas where I was like, how am I going to be dad and mom? And on one level, God reminded me. Davey, you just need to be a really good dad. That's it. You don't have to feel the pressure of being mom too. That really what Jesus does, the great I am is he steps in and he is what 
all of us need him to be, right? And he fills in the gaps and gives us grace. But I also found that there were some of those motherly qualities that began to get enhanced inside of me. Things that I was attuned to that I probably would have never been attuned to just because by default, Amanda was more the one that was attuned to that stuff. And so it was a really beautiful thing to kind of grow in that space, especially in that two and a half year journey of, of being a single dad. Well, one of the, I guess one of the funniest questions I get, and this is for men exclusively, I've had so many people be like, what is it like? Like, what is it like to have lost your spouse? What is it like to step into like, just whatever? Yeah. That's so weird. Uh, everybody's like, I don't know how my world would look without my wife. Uh, and, and I can say from my experience, the best way I can describe it is it kind of feels like you lost a limb. Like you're just kind of yes. trying to do life addled and just you're like, I'm making this work, but I, 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 I this left arm is gone. Like, did, did you have yeah. that kind of a sense too, where like, uh, there's a part of me that's just missing. It was unexpected, Absolutely. honestly. Yeah. And one of the ways I describe it is like two become one. And then that one feels like it, I'm now I'm half, right? So I'm now asking all the questions like, who am I? now because I'm having to reorient my identity in Christ again and like without a spouse. What's my purpose? Am I still called to the same things that we were called to? Am I still, still supposed to do life the same way that we did life? You know, like what is this, what does this all look like? And then at the same time, you know, I write about this in the book. I think it, I got the language, that whole limb thing from C.S. Lewis in A Grief Observed, which is just an incredible resource. It really felt like, I felt like for the first time I was feeling understood or, uh, you know, I'm, it was reading my mail when I read a grief observed, but he talked about that kind of phantom phenomenon where when people who actually lose a limb, they, they go to scratch an itch that they, they feel a phantom itch that they feel. And I felt the same way when it came to, you know, metaphorically, when it came to Amanda, I'd find myself, especially early on, pick up the phone and start to call her about something and then just realize like, wait a minute, you know, I can't, or start to text her or something. And, and it did, it just felt like I was walking around without this limb, trying to figure out how do I do life now without this? I'm so used to functioning in a certain way. And now I've got to figure out how to function without it, you know? And I think one of the despairing things is to, to have the, the, um, finality of knowing I'm never going to have this limb again, you know? And even if you, even if you get remarried, like nothing replaces, it's like, I'm never going to have this limb, like Amanda, she's gone. And that's, a, that's a very, I mean, that just like hits you, you know, sometimes randomly where you're like, I can't believe it. I can't believe this is, this is my life. Yeah. I mean, there is that, and this is just to be expected, but you have all these patterns of like, when I started travel again, traveling again, like I had a rhythm of, okay, when I get on the plane, I love you and let mm -hmm. you know when I like all the things that you just did for years, just. It's odd, or you'll have things right. you're excited about and want to celebrate. Well, what would you do? You would text your wife right. or call your wife. And so I, f I like uh, like those patterns are in your brain for a long yeah. time, and it's 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 odd, but that it comes up at the most um, strangest and it random really times. And Sean, I, I think, what I had to start doing is I had to start every time I did that, I had to redirect that to the Lord. And and again, I'm not good. trying to sound over, over spiritual, but I do think that that's part of what the Lord is inviting us into in that. And I write about that in the book, just this idea of a new season of contentment. What does it look like now, God, for me and you, for me to find once again, the fullness of my identity and my contentment in you? You know, if Paul says that he has learned to be content in every season, then this season right here, whatever this is, and however long it is as a widower, how do I find contentment in that, right? Because my peace is not predicated on my circumstance. So I've got to find a peace again that, um, that I can walk in. I love that uh, way you describe it as just a, a new season of content contentment because you really do have to embrace that. This is, right. for better or worse, this is your new season. So you may as right. well embrace it and keep moving forward. Uh, one of the things that's funny is how much other people want to project their own stuff into your story and into yeah. your journey. Um, but I, I like what you said a moment ago, like even in terms of like having conversations with friends and family, especially when you move towards thinking about dating and remarriage and all those things is is really not that you have to over explain this to people, but some people's attitude is like you're replacing your, your wife right. or whatever. Right. It's like they're in heaven with Jesus. Like yeah. that, that part of the story, that covenant it's fulfilled. We walked right. it out and it didn't, it didn't end how we wanted, but you know, right. my, you know, she's up in heaven with Jesus. She's healed That's and right. whole and, and all those things. And just 
it, you really, you need to, and this is more just coaching and feedback. If you're, yeah. if you can relate to both of our journeys, just, you, you just need to be willing to say, Hey, you know, I'm not replacing her. This is yeah. part of the new season of God restoring and rebuilding is whatever this new relationship is. And that's okay. But that's right. Uh, for better or worse, some people are just going to be uncomfortable with it because, uh, you know, uh, they're not quite ready to move on. Right. And our, our stories are a little bit different in the sense that yours was like everything shifted in a day. Yep. Mine was almost over the course of two years. And I, I haven't talked with other guys who walked out a, a long cancer journey with a spouse. It's almost like your marriage ends in some ways when you get yep. that diagnosis. Like you never yeah, go like back a preliminary to, grief. to yeah. normal. And so there's this weird grieving that happens over the year or years right. versus, and, and so like what's the odd thing there is everybody else starts grieving at the memorial service kind of time frame right, or when that person right. goes home to heaven and you've been grieving this over a long yep. haul. And so there's the, the, depending on the circumstances, the dynamics, uh, will vary. I, yeah. I, I guess I'm curious in your journey, like how did you deal with managing people trying to yeah. insert themselves or give you good advice? Everybody right, has things right. they need to share with you. Yeah. Well, I think it's really important what you're saying to give people permission that they have to grieve at their own pace and to realize that everybody else is going to grieve at their own pace, but also to realize the pretty typical reality. I mean, what you're describing is what I hear over and over and over from other widowers. And what my experience is, is that every single day I was confronted with the reality that my wife was no longer there. So I was forced to deal with it as opposed to everybody else in her life, including family members, you know. They were only confronted with that reality once they, in their normal rhythm, they would have interacted with her, right? Which is not as frequent as my normal rhythm interacting. So I am expediting my grieving journey. I'm getting through all of the different, and there's no really stages of grief. It's more cyclical, but I'm getting through all of that stuff faster, more frequently than everybody else. So naturally I am going to be further down the track than they are. So I think it's important to understand that how you navigate those conversations. <laughs> That's a difficult one to navigate, right? I think it's very hard. And what kind of sucks is that you have to, you have to be the one almost being proactive in that, you as the griever. And I think that's just a really, I hate that. I hate that, but that is kind of the reality because nobody else in your life, there are very few people that have just this beautiful uh, brotherhood or sisterhood of someone who comes in and, and goes, hey, let me kind of bring all of this wisdom into your life and let me be kind of the advocate for you in this to help make sure the rest of your family has this wisdom. So somehow you have to be the one that kind of leads the way in that, which means you just have to be very over communicative and you just have to say, Hey, listen, you may not be at this place right now, but I want to share with you where I'm at. And that's okay if you're not at that place. But, um, you know, and, and I think it's really important too, to make sure that people understand the boundaries of going, I'm not um, asking your permission. I'm actually, I just, but I want to involve you in this because I care about you and I do value what you think. But at the end of the day, this is, this is a decision that I'm going to have to make and I'm making it with the counsel that I have, right? I'm definitely not saying throw counsel out. I think, right? You have to have good counsel. Proverbs says that plans fail for lack of counsel with many advisors, they succeed. But your counsel, your team around you in this season need to be people who are not subjectively so close and emotionally so close to the situation that their counsel is going to be biased. They need to be people that have more of an objective perspective on your healing journey, the wholeness, your health, and whether or not they can help you assess, okay, I do feel like that you're ready to take on this new season and responsibility of remarriage. And you know, they can help you assess and discern, are you just doing this because you're lonely? And you're trying to fill some kind of void in your life, or are you really taking on Ephesians five and saying, you know what, I'm ready to love someone again, like Christ loves the church and I'm ready to give myself up for her. Right? So I think that all of those things are really important, but the thing that I've found is just being out front with that communication. And I think that's the book you're going to write, Sean, is like how to right? because when you're in the middle of it, you don't know what to communicate, what not to communicate. Right? That's what we talked to these widowers about at the refuge widower retreat a lot. We're like, here are some things to go ahead and establish with your in-laws, with your, you know, here are some conversations to go ahead and have. You're not ready to have this conversation. I know that they're not ready to have this conversation, but we all wish we had had this conversation earlier, you know? Yeah. Managing the expect, I don't know if managing the expectations, 
maintaining those relationships in a healthy way, especially with, yeah. you know, your mother-in-law, father-in-law, brother, sister-in-law, all that. I mean, that that's its own emotional roller coaster, you know, in terms of, and especially, um, you know, when you do get into that place of dating and remarriage, it's going to be very hard for those people in a yes. way that's just different. And so, uh, you just got to be ready for that. Even, when even you- in my own circumstances, I've had some upfront conversations with my sister and she's like, you know, if you're going to start dating, can you not have me find out on Facebook? Like, can you just call me and just warn me that this is coming? So I don't yeah. feel like it's good. you're like keeping us out just because they, they care about the kids and everything Absolutely. that's going on in their life. And so, uh, but that's a whole, you know, that could be a whole book in itself about just yes. manage those, those special relationships in a way that honors your wife, honors your yeah. children and stuff. Cause it's not like you're just cutting them out of your life and moving on. That's right. Uh, but there's a lot of emotion, uh, certainly pent up there, uh, with everyone. Right. Uh, one of the things I ask guys who have lost a spouse that I'm just curious about is like, what did you miss the most? Like, like for me, I can say it's the random day to day of, you know, yeah. you, you brush by your wife and you give her a hug or a kiss or smell her hair. Or you see her across the room at church and you kind of yeah. lock eyes and there's some community. Like it's for me, it was just silly little things like nothing yeah. grandiose. It was just the day to day rhythm of, I have a good, I had a good life kind of a thing. I'm curious, right. like, what was that for you? Yeah. I mean, I think I would agree. I, I would relate in that same fashion. I shared everything with Amanda, everything. I mean, there was not one part of my heart that she didn't know good, bad, and ugly. There was not one part of my experience in a day that she didn't know about. And so to have that just like best friend and confidant, you know, that you're journeying life with, she had this balance and this wisdom that could really help to, um, calibrate me when I felt, you know, like out of calibration, maybe emotionally, or I was reacting from something that had happened that day a little bit, you know, out of balance. And she was really able to, in beautiful ways, help me feel heard and understood, but also help to recalibrate me and remember what's most important and kind of tether my feet back to the ground. And that was something that was so amazing about her. And uh, probably what I missed the most is just like our friendship and how we interacted. It seemed just so easy. And I'm grateful for that. You know, we only had seven years of marriage, which is interesting. Seven's like the nu- the number of perfection. We knew each other for 10 years. And I'm grateful. That I know this is not everybody's story. I'm grateful that our marriage seemed just very easy. And there was not a whole lot. It's like God custom fit us together, knowing that we would only be together th- for that amount of time. So we really just got to enjoy what we were doing together and enjoy each other. And um and so, um, again, I know that's not everybody's experience. And, and I know that some people, you know, their marriage is just this really, it's forged in the fire and it's tough. And then it ends tragically and there's no explanation for that. But I think that's one of the things I miss the most about Amanda. Well, I can really relate to that too. I, uh, cause again, I've, I've worked really hard. Again, I express myself through words, like a lot of authors. Um, but I, I think I, I would articulate is I miss having access to the brilliance of the female mind in the sense that. You know, when you've done life with a best friend for so many years who understands you at such a deep level, like you talk about, you talk about everything and right. and your wife knows your rhythms and your patterns. Like, okay, is this like, it's been six months since you brought this up. Are you just having a rough time at work right, right. now? We need to right. figure this out and process or whatever, but just losing, losing access to that yeah. deep connection that yeah, it's, yeah, that's, that's, you know, besides the day-to-day things, I probably miss that the most because then you get to make all the decisions on your own. And, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> that, that's and on some level, journey it, itself. some level there was like, okay, this is, you know, this can be, this can feel like a new kind of freedom, but on many levels, you just feel terrified. Cause you're like, wait a minute, where's the, where's my sounding board? I used to have a sounding board on every decision and I made Absolutely. me feel more secure. Right. And so I think I do re- recognize there, there are a lot of guys that they just kind of go off and start making their decisions and a- autonomy, right? And there's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, and a lot of times I see them wind up really just tail spinning in life because of that. But it, more of that is a coping mechanism because of the hurt they're experiencing and the loneliness that they're experiencing. But I think it is really important then to gather other people around you to try to counterbalance that, make sure that you have a good, wise counsel so that you aren't falling prey and susceptible to, I mean, I think the devil really wants to come in and do some major damage in the the season of widowhood for a lot of widowers, uh, that make them do things and experience things and be in settings that they would, that they regret later on. They're like, I wish I'd never, but they're hurt. They're, they're in pain, you know? 
yeah, I think there can be a tendency to want to simply make decisions to set things in motion, see, see momentum somewhere in your right. life because you feel like you're stuck uh, on so many fronts. Um, you know, we won't talk about the car I bought, but uh, <laughs> like I, I find, uh, although that was a gift from my wife. There's a story. Hey, you know what? Some of that. that's okay. Some um, of that's okay. But I've found almost every guy has something crazy they've yep. done. Like the guy I met uh, yep. a couple of weeks ago who shared a story with me is like, did you, did you like spend money in a crazy way? He's like, I spent twenty thousand dollars on audio equipment, and I. And, but this was his grief process. He's a creative. He's like, yeah. I wrote an album to process wow. losing my, you know, wow. and and their story and their journey. Um, you know, the car yep. I bought was something my wife was just like, buy something you've always wanted and just remember me every time. You yeah. Do. So, uh, did you do anything crazy? Just random question, like anything you did that was way out of the box for you. Well, my craziness, you know, I think there are definitely some like minor micro decisions. I made that I look back, I'm like, I would never make that decision again. I'm kind of feel foolish making those decisions. I did spend some money on clothes and different things like that. And I think that all of that stuff is okay. I think just to remember that there needs to be a governor on it, right? That like, absolutely. you know, and I tell widowers that like, Hey, listen, put a governor on it and go, all right, if I feel like I need to do this just to kind of, there's, there's, you're, you're full of so much pain, right? So much pain that there are some elements where it's like, this is okay. Just kind of cope a little bit with this, right? Now, if you start to get into these things that are going to be detrimental and dangerous to you, right? Or you start to get down a slippery slope, that's when you got to have others in your life who are going, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. You're getting down this slippery slope. So, you know, you don't want to, you also don't want to be bound up in this like legalistic, rigid kind of, because that's recipe for disaster just as much. So put a governor on it, have people around you that are going to knock some sense into you. And, um, and then really just walk with the Lord. Yeah. I, I, uh, there's a whole lot, I think you and I could talk to guys about yeah. with positive coping mechanisms. Cause I think, yeah. you know, whether, whether it's, uh, you experience a tragedy in a day or you walk something out over the long term like I did, uh, there's, there are those functional idols we've had in our lives where it's yep. like, okay, am I bringing this to Jesus? Or am I going to go drink to, I mean, just, or whatever. And it your, rises to the top when you go through this. Yeah. You will days, discover yeah. what your functional idols are. <laughs> you will. There, there are days you just want to shut your mind off. Like for, yep. for me now, it's like, all right, I'm having a rough day. I go for a drive. I live in South Carolina right now. I okay. drive to Greenville. I get a cup of coffee at Barnes and Noble and I drive home. And that gives me 70 minutes to yeah. pray and process and kind of get out of the funk I'm in. So like, I feel like yeah. you really have to push yourself into positive coping mechanisms that allow you to process and whatever. Yep. Um, but just, just know that you're going to have to face those good and bad all along the journey. Cause it's just, I feel like it's part of how we're wired. Like we have it to is. make those choices. Do I turn, do I bring this to God or am I going to take this to my functional idol? Right. And, uh, yeah, ho hopefully we wow. can all get to the place where we choose the functional idols less because yes, that's a slippery slope. Yes. Uh, sure. there are a million other places I'd like to go, but <laughs> as a responsible dad, I do have to take a daughter yes, to do. work. Who knew? We'll just have Who to knew? do this again sometime. Yeah. Tomorrow when we record for the other yep. podcast, <laughs> uh, David, you have obviously the new book, you have resources. So if we want to yeah, podcast, all the things we want to connect yeah. into your world, where's the best place for us to find you? Everything is nothing is wasted. Um, nothing is wasted.com. Uh, the book is called nothing is wasted. The podcast is called the nothing is wasted podcast. You can connect with me personally on Instagram, Davey Blackburn, D-A-V-E-Y, B-L-A-C-K-B-U-R-N. And you'll be able to find everything else we have. We've got courses, mini courses, all kinds of content on our membership library and free content. We've got coaches. I mean, I would say that's probably one of the most amazing things we offer as a ministry is coaches that can walk with you in the exact, because they understand it, they've been there, they've gone through the same thing you've gone through. So we actually have widower coaches who have been down that journey and they know they're like a Sherpa. They're able to go, here's the pitfalls that you're going to run into. But they also have this tenderness and this grace to know like, hey, maybe this is a positive coping mechanism. It's all right. Let me just help you put a governor on it. So um, yeah, that's one of them. Uh, that's what we do. And that's how you can connect, connect with us. And we'll make it easy like we do with every episode. We'll have links in the description and show notes to websites, places where you're going to pick up the book, all the things. You already sold me on the the whole coaching thing. That's something I've actually been looking for. So uh, I'll, well, sign I'll up connect for you that with our best week, widower coach, Ken Roberts. I think he'd be amazing for you. He's incredible. Awesome. awesome. I appreciate that. Well, Davey, uh, thank you for the time. Thanks for being a part of the first few episodes of Grieve Like a Man. Yeah. It's, a, it's a bit experimental, but I love I love where we landed. And just thanks for pouring into me and thanks for pouring into the audience, man. I really yeah, appreciate thanks, it. Yeah, thanks, Sean. It's been an honor, man.